Hello, everyone. Dr. Jack Wolfson, cardiologist for another episode of the Healthy Heart Show. And I'm super excited to interview Judy Cho. And Judy is a board certified uh, holistic uh, practitioner uh, in nutrition. And she's a nutritional therapy practitioner from the Nutri uh, Nutritional Therapy Association, a group, uh, an organization I think very highly of. I spoke uh, at their event years ago. She does hold a degree in psychology and communications at uh, from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, but she's best known as the author of the uh, book, The Carnivore Cure, which was one of the first carnivore books to come on the scene. Uh, one of my favorite books uh, overall as it relates to nutrition, as far as people trying to get healthy and well. Uh, Amazon bestselling book, you know, just hundreds and hundreds of glowing reviews uh, on Amazon. And she created a great team around her and lots, lots of things going on. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to interview one of the carnivore experts as it relates to how, you know, she's seen so much with different people, patients, clients uh, in her tribe. So welcome, Judy Cho. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk with you. No, oh, excellent. So, um, uh, you know, and, and I will say this before we get started, we're not only going to talk about carnivore, we're going to get into so many other things because you are so well, well rounded, you're most known for carnivore, but uh, you and I have had some really good discussions regarding mold, environmental toxins, uh, but uh, let's just kind of get, you know, give us a little bit of your backstory and then kind of ultimately how you got into carnivore. Yeah, so I was plant based for, I don't know, like 12 years. I grew up in California um, and I thought eating plant based was the healthiest thing for me to do because I had a few extra pounds I wanted to lose. Did a master cleanse uh, where you eat just lemon, I think cayenne pepper and honey or maple syrup. And, and then from there, I read his book and he was, I think he was plant based. So then I thought, oh, I'll be plant-based and uh, Berkeley is so conducive to being plant-based friendly. And so I ate that way for 12 years. I started struggling with mental illness and an eating disorder. Never once did I attribute it to the way I was eating. Uh, I was somehow able to manage that lifestyle for again, about 12 years. And then I had my first son and things kind of came crashing down. So I didn't do the eat well, live well, sleep well, um, as you mentioned. And, and so I wasn't sleeping enough. I was, uh, I was being such a type A mom and wanting to make sure that my son got enough breast milk. So I would pump around the clock. So that affected me too. And then I had to get on antibiotics because, or they told me that I needed to, because I had mastitis. And so I got on within a few days of getting on that something happened. I had like a break where I just lost my memory for a little bit. Um, my parents, my husband didn't know what to do with me. So they put me into a mental hospital. Um, it was New Year's Eve and, and so on and so forth. And in the hospital, they never figured out what happened to me. They just said, I think she suffers from postpartum depression and she has an eating disorder. So we think she should go into e an eating disorder facility. So that's where I went. Eventually my memory came back. They put me on antidepressants, antipsychotics. I did everything I could to try to, be a better mom and try to get back things um, into place. And I was still very plant-based and never once in the eating disorder facility, did they say, I don't know if it makes sense that you're eating just carbohydrates and, um, and lean proteins. And, and so I stayed plant-based. I tried to do a lot of the mind body work in there and that was all good, but I still was not nourishing my body properly. And I had no idea. And I was a management consultant through this, all of this, I was pre-med, but I shifted to doing consulting work. And, and I had to go on disability because I lost my memory and I lost a lot of like my cognitive abilities during that time. And my brother went keto and I thought that is crazy that you're adding all this butter to your coffee. You're going to have a heart attack. And as I did my research while I was again on leave uh, from work, I realized that I was the one that was wrong. So I started a keto diet that was plant-based <clears throat> and it helped me a little bit, but I would still always go back to my behaviors of ending up binging and purging. And I thought, I guess I'm just broken. The psychiatrist in the eating disorder facility said, you know, it sounds like you've had low mood for the, your whole life. And so what's so wrong with if somebody's hurt and they take Advil or Tylenol, that's something we consider normal. So for you with a low functioning mood brain, what's so wrong if you took antidepressants your whole life? And so I bought into it and I took it, but it didn't work. And so then they put me on antipsychotics and all of these other things. And when I started the keto diet, I slowly started weaning myself off because it wasn't working fully for one. And I would still fall. And eventually I had a friend that said, there's this crazy thing called a carnivore diet. And I thought it was 
crazy because again, I wasn't eating meat for 12 years. And um, I think it was in a moment of true desperation where I was in the bathroom and I just sort of didn't want to live anymore. And I just thought, you know what? There are these miracle stories with carnivore. Maybe I'll just try that um, because I don't know how to fix myself. And so I tried it. I was going to just do it for a few weeks to a month and it changed my life. So the physical side of my hunger, the hunger cues where I couldn't control, but I needed to go and binge went away. But the mental side, the side where I was still coping with food, uh, using it as an escape that still remained. And I needed to do a lot of work on that and internal work, but the physical healing of, oh my gosh, my body just knew nutrition and proper nutrition changed my life. And I wanted to understand why I went back to nutritional therapy school. I went back to school to learn more, to understand nutrition, the way the body works, how the biochem side of all the body works. And, and then I just started throwing up graphics on social media because that was the background I had was in consulting and understanding lots of information into these graphics. And I started sharing it. It kind of took off. And then I decided I'm going to change my career because I have a passion in this. Um, I was so broken for so long. And I think this needs to get out because for so many people that are desperate and desolate and truly on their last leg of hope, they can change their diet and do so much. And then obviously all the other things you preach as well. That is a phenomenal intro and just a <laughs> you know, crazy story. And I think the most powerful people in the health industry, I'm not talking about the sickness industry, of course, but the health industry are the people who've struggled on their own or cared for someone or helped someone who struggled. So this is quite the story. And I'm sure obviously it makes you very enthusiastic about kind of preaching the gospel uh, of carnivore. So many things that you say, you know, talked about, uh, you know, again, is it, you know, whether it's the, you know, master cleanse, I love that <laughs> kind of stuff. Cause I remember that from early on in my travails about the master cleanse, you go into plat, uh, plant-based, you develop the mental health issues because you're deficient in all these different vitamins, minerals, you know, proteins and fats uh, that you can't get from the uh, plant world. Uh, I mean, uh, let me say this, Judy, how many, how many people you think share a very similar story to you both uh, female, probably more so, uh, but the men as well? How many people have that same story? Uh, I mean, I don't think everyone has the mental breakdown, but that became my bigger why, right? Because I got so sick and I really hit rock bottom and then I became the biggest advocate, but the belief that a plant-based diet is healthy for you. And if you have heart disease, you have any illness that if you ate more plants, you would be healthier, um, and reduce the saturated fats or reduce the, the, the meats that you're eating or the eggs or the butter, then you'll have a healthy life. I think that's predominantly everyone, everyone believes that if we eat more plant-based, maybe a little bit of fish, maybe a little bit of eggs, um, and you don't eat any, and maybe have olive oil, but not the butter, not the red meat with all the fat, you got to make sure and cut off all the fat. That's what will bring you health. And it's just that it's so hard for people to do that. And I think it's because we're designed not to eat that way. We want the fat, but when people, people believe that if they only had enough willpower and they ate that way, that would provide them health, but it's so opposite from the truth. But it's a, you know, it's a, I guess um, being deprived in the animal foods, and I think seafood, and you and I have talked about this, that seafood is a major player here, but, Great. you know, the uh, people being uh, deprived of these, it leads to these, you know, brain-based symptoms, but it doesn't have to be like hospitalized. It just may be like a little bit depressed, a little bit anxious, a little bit stressed out. Uh, maybe this kind of you don't you're not bipolar uh, with manic and and depression, but there's a medical diagnosis called cyclothymia, and where you're kind of like you kind of oscillate between you know better mood or more ma more manic type moods and more depressed moods, but not to that extreme level. And right, how many people are walking around you know these days and they're and they're struggling with these kind of you know ups and downs that can be truly helped with, with the right diet and lifestyle. Yeah, and the way that I try to teach um, our communities and our clients and patients is, is super logical, basic terms. And the way that I think about how our body uses fat, especially if you're eating animal fats, which are, it's just natural. How do you make tallow or pork or beef lard? It's, uh, I'm sorry, beef fat or pork lard. It's all, it's all you're doing is cooking the meat and then there's fat left over. Whereas all these seed oils and vegetable oils, they have to render it from toxic plants, such as canola oils from rapeseed. And they do all of this 
chemical sterilization, deodorization, and all of these things to make it then for us to eat. And so we know from that alone that one is more natural than the other. And if animal fats have always been around for however long, then why is it all of a sudden a new disease such as heart disease is something new, but it's an old food that's causing that. And there's no logic in that. And, and maybe it's all the other new foods that we're bringing in these processed foods, the food dyes, the chemicals, the GMO foods, and all the pesticides and herbicides we're using. But from a human body side, like that's the side I want to like, why, why did I struggle from mental illness just because I ate plants? And there's so many reasons for it. First of all, your brain is 60% fat and a lot of the brain needs cholesterol. And so yes, your body will produce some amounts of the cholesterol that your body needs. But if we are stressed, your adrenals, you love to use cholesterol and you love to use fat. And if you don't have enough in the body, when we're eating low fat, or we're not eating the right fats, then your body has nothing to pull from. And so therefore there can, that can impact your mental health. Um, every, almost every cell in your body, the outer layer is fat. So if you don't have quality fats, again, how do you think your cells are going to be made? And when I was younger, I would explain to my kids, it's like creating a good Lego or a good, a good house. If you don't have the good raw materials, then your house will be only as strong as the raw materials made. And if we know that almost every cell in our body requires quality fats, what is it doing when we're eating low fat or we're eating uh, fats that are made from these toxic rapeseed plants and then turned into soybean oil or canola oil. And then lastly, um, I think where my mental illness struggle really came is a lot of our hormones are made from fat. So the co cholesterol is used to produce all the sex hormones, all, all of the glucocorticoid hormones, and then our mineral balancing hormones. So if you don't eat enough fat or taking care of your body, or you're highly stressed, all of those become compromised. I wonder how many of the women and men that are struggling with infertility, with low testosterone, all of those require cholesterol and saturated fats. And when we don't eat sufficiently, and when we're also stressed, which taps into that fat that we maybe produce inside our bodies, what does that do for our health? And I think these are a lot of the conversations that are not discussed when it's so important. And that's why these things are so important. And there's so many studies now where they'll show low cholesterol affects mood, low cholesterol affects mental health. Um, look, people with low cholesterol, actually, if you're older and if you're a woman, you have a higher chance of dying than if you had higher levels of cholesterol. So why isn't this in the public space of, you know, the, the media sharing that actually you need cholesterol. And so when we take statins or we take drugs that are reducing cholesterol, is it taking it from the part of your brain or is it taking it from other parts of your body? These are the concerns that we don't talk about or think about enough. And so I'm not surprised that I was struggling so much with mental illness. Yeah, I think, you know, as you know, uh, you know, as far as, you know, why, why does the media and, and, and pretty much everybody else and the doctors and stuff like that, they're all, you know, professing still, you know, lower fat, you know, type of eating, right? It's all just big ag, big pharma, trying to get, uh, you know, trying to keep us sick and trying to keep us buying their, you know, crappy products that really started, you know, in the 1970s, you know, and on to get us to our situation. You know, you mentioned that you were, were you know, you know, you had your baby and stuff like that. You were plant-based. Tell, you know, maybe go into that a little bit more as far as, you know, what are the dangers of being plant-based or being vegan uh, while you're, you know, trying to get pregnant, pregnant, uh, uh, breastfeeding, and then uh, any differences in any of the older children, maybe that uh, were not kind of grown, if you will, uh, in a in a vegan uh, vessel. Yeah. So uh, one one thing that you could think of is um, there's a lot of folate deficiency, and if you're deficient with folate, it can totally affect your pregnancy. Um, again, we talked about a lot of that fat. Uh, the 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 baby requires so much nutrition in order to grow properly. And your body is very smart. If it feels that you are your, your vessel as a body is not healthy enough, it'll never let you get pregnant because it's always thinking I need to let you survive another day. And if you're not healthy enough, I will never let you get pregnant. And so when somebody is not, it's, it's the skin, the hair, um, the ability to get pregnant, having your menses monthly, those are the signs that if someone is healthy enough or fertile enough, and it's really I mean, how do we fuel our body? It's all about the nutrition. There are uh, nutritional deficiencies in plant-based diets. Obviously the fat can be low. I know people could say, well, we can eat olive oil. 
oftentimes olive oils can be cut with other seed oil. So we just don't know for sure. But um, additionally to that, it's when you eat just are mostly plants and in its raw form. So if you're having big bowl salads, oftentimes it's a wreck on your gut. And most people have poor gut function. And it is in the gut that it's not just what you're eating. So yes, spinach has technically some level of iron, but it doesn't have the usable form of iron that we need in our bodies. So when I was plant based, I should have known that as a clue with my first child, my doctor, I was eating a pound of spinach every single day, I wasn't eating, they didn't have beyond burgers back then. And so I was eating mostly plant based salads. And I was eating a pound of spinach a day. And especially being pregnant, I thought, okay, that will take care of my iron needs. And lo and behold, my OBGYN said, Judy, you are anemic, and you need to take iron pills. And I did think, well, that's weird. I eat salad, but I didn't think anything beyond that because I didn't know much about nutrition. And so I said, okay. And I ended up taking an iron supplement for the rest of my pregnancy. I, that amount of salad or that amount of spinach should have been more than enough for my daily value of iron, but it wasn't. And it's because again, if the nutrition in uh, plant-based foods have to often be converted into the version that we can use. And also if our gut function isn't good, then it won't even do that breakdown product uh, process. And also there are certain genes that um, you need. So certain genetics where, for example, with vitamin A, uh, you can have beta carotene, but if you are missing a certain genetic, then you can't really do that conversion to make it the usable form of vitamin A from beta carotene. So all of that beta carotene that you think is vitamin A that will support your eye health and all the other wonders of vitamin A is actually not even being as, as broken down and assimilated. Whereas you can have some eggs or have some butter or have some beef liver, and you could get the usable form of vitamin A, even with poor gut function, and you can get the nutrients that you need. So when you think about when you're making a baby, not only do you need proper nutrition for yourself, now you need it to grow this wonderful, magnificent baby inside you. And if you don't have proper nutrition, you're starting with such a shaky start. And so it'll be one thing to get pregnant. But beyond that, if you don't have the nutrition, I mean, there's just a lot of there's so many risks with nutritional deficiencies with then babies having a lot of issues moving forward. And do you notice any differences though in your children as you yeah. kind of maybe, you know, again, had more children and, you know, again, coming from more of a, a meat-based or meat, you know, meat focused. Yeah. So I would say, so I had two children, unfortunately, both of them were mostly plant-based diets um, in the pregnancy. So I'll never be able to know for certain my first child, because I got on the, the class C drugs of the psychiatric drugs, I, had to stop nursing when he was six months. So he got on formula. And then I thought the right thing to do was to fly in Germany, a uh, German formula for the toddler formulas, not knowing again, even if it's organic and all the higher quality, it still had the, the seed oils and seed a oils. lot of the sugars in it. Um, and so my older son tends to put on weight a little bit more and I'll never know, is it because for two and a half years of your very early life, did I make you a little bit more insulin resistant? And then my younger child, uh, right when he was born is when I turned keto. And for him, he was meat based from like the day that he could even start using eating finger mm. foods. And he is on the leaner side. Now, I would say that um, the biggest difference I saw was, so I did have to stop nursing, I don't know if I would have been able to continue nursing. But with my second child, he nursed until he was the day he turned age five. So I don't yeah. know if it was that, that meat based diet I had, but I was able to nurse granted the last few years was just one time a night, sure. but the fact that I could nurse for that long, um, it was, I, I think it was truly because of my diet. Kudos to you. Five years is, is <laughs> superhuman. <a> <laughs> and I, I live with a superhuman as well, who does that. And, and that's of course, just uh, natural. We actually, we have backyard goats. And uh, uh, the goat babies are six months of age and they still nurse off their mother. And typically goats are taken away from the mother like two months and everybody's like, oh, no big deal. Uh, but it was a big deal, you know, to us. And again, our, our goats still still nurse and we get a little bit of milk for ourselves, but um, uh, definitely very interesting. When you when we say carnivore, uh, what what is for you personally, what what do you do on a percentage basis? What because I it's correct me if I'm wrong, the actual definition of carnivore is you know at least 70 percent uh animal based. I think if you look it up in the dictionary, Wikipedia or something like that, it's 70 percent. Uh, even lions and tigers and animals in the wild, they're you know, even dogs and coyotes, like they're going to eat some plants. Uh, tell us where, where you're at and uh, 
you know, how you recommend it to, to people in that range of like 70 to 100%, uh, break it down. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I didn't mention about post being carnivore really quickly is I'm not on any medication. So I'm in my very early forties and I have zero medications. I'm not on any hormones. I sleep through the night. My menses is normal. So there is so much that also heal that I don't talk about other than the mental health side. And again, no medications at all. And I don't suffer from depression. So that whole, you are totally broken and born kind of broken. Um, the low mood thing is so not true. Yes. I'll have days where I'm a little bit more cranky and I think that's very normal, but I don't struggle with depression at all. Um, so I do think, and I can totally say that whether it was a keto diet, plant-based or just plant-based, I am the healthiest eating meat-based. I'm not hundred percent carnivore anymore. And so that segues into your question. Um, our practice uses the carnivore cure elimination diet. And all it really simply is, is if you are really sick, if you are unwell, if you have any gut conditions, um, all elimination diets, whether it's autoimmune paleo, um, the SCC diet, SCD diet, the FODMAP diet, all of these diets eliminate some form or fashion of the plant-based diet world. And so my logic was just, why don't we just, if we're going to do an elimination diet anyway, and, and then going to the grocery store and getting confused of what to buy and how much and how to cook it, let's just eat meat for just a little bit and figure out, can you reduce a lot of your symptoms, a lot of your inflammation? Inflammation is the main cause of the modern day health disease. So if we can reduce the inflammation, because we're not eating the plant toxins that have a lot of plants that have the plant toxins and the herbicides and so on and so forth, then maybe we could reduce the inflammation in the gut. Your gut has most of your immune system and it has the ability to assimilate your nutrients. So maybe we can see how much can I heal with the diet and then once you have a baseline of health, so we go really, really strict first, that might just be ruminant meats. So um, lamb, uh, cow and uh, foods like that. And then if you find healing and you're sort of ready to bring in other foods, then we'll bring in the chicken, the pork, the, the salmon and all of that. And then beyond that, it's really just, you know, where can you add back plants that you still feel good enough? And, and then, and then obviously there's a subset that none of that works fully. And that's where I think the mold, the environment piece comes in too. But by our definition in the carnivore community, there's really strict people that say carnivore is nothing that's from the plant world. So even coffee is out, which I think if coffee, if, if you leave in a little bit and that allows you to stay consistent for most of your diet, then I'm not as much of a stickler. If that is affecting your adrenals, maybe, but I don't know if that, if that, is the answer for everybody. And so we tailor our carnivore to the person. If somebody cannot stick to 80% meat only, then how am I gonna force that on them? Because every day they'll struggle, then they'll go on the shame bus and then never figure out um, how to eat properly because they're all thinking either I'm in or I'm gonna binge. And so we always meet the person where they are. But for our definition of carnivore, it's just anything that's part of the animal kingdom, whether it's air, land, or sea. Got it. And why do you think a lot of the carnivore, you know, experts, uh, if you will, or the carnivore gurus, uh, I, I feel they don't give seafood uh, enough play. And sometimes in the cases, you know, like, you know, Sean Baker, I'm always watching videos that show up in my Instagram feed and Sean Baker, and he's like, just having a having a steak. And I mean, he's not even like eating the organs necessarily. I never see him eat seafood. So why are these kind of gurus? Why aren't they mentioning seafood? Uh, I don't, so I couldn't give you my perspective. I'm not exactly sure the why. I think I'm the only, um, no, I, I won't say the only, but of some of these older carnivores, I would say, I guess I'm the only nutritionist. And so maybe that's why, like I've dug into the actual nutrition and then the benefits of omega-3s and reduction of inflammation. We see it with one of our supplements that we sell um, as a third-party vendor, but we see people's inflammation go down and pain go down by taking like an omega-3 supplement. So I know for sure in our practice, we see the benefits of it. When you're eating a ribeye steak that's juicy and it's uh, so tasty to think of that I'm going to eat salmon doesn't sound as tasty. So I think that's a big thing of there's this narrative in the carnivore space where it's like, eat what you enjoy. And I agree to that to an extent, but once you've been on it for a while, you just want to take it, take a safer stance. And again, this might be because I'm a nutritionist, but I believe you should eat a variety of meats, right? So it's not just the cow. It's not just, um, um, a certain meat it's eating a variety because all meats have different levels of nutrition. Yes. All of them have a good amount of B vitamins, but like you said, Salmon has a lot of omega threes. They ha it has all of the fat soluble vitamins. It has a lot more of the minerals. Oysters is are so rich in minerals. And so I know this as a nutritionist and 
for me, as I'm trying to use food as medicine to heal, that's why we recommend those things. I don't know if the other carnivore influencers are looking at it, at it to that fine of a detail. It might just be, hey, meat works for me. Um, I've reduced inflammation. I feel better. So this is how I'm going to eat. If it's not broken, why fix it? And so maybe that's why they're sharing their N equals ones to everyone else. I think we are the only full-time practice where we work one-on-one -on -one with uh, carnivore patients and clients, at least that are, are a, um, I guess, a carnivore advocate from a while ago. So maybe that too. I mean, we see people that need a little bit of iodine. And so maybe eating sardines is a benefit and sardines, again, have that omega-3s. I also think um, like Paul Saladino, for example, he's not a big fan of fish because he says that the sea is toxic of all the waste, but it's interesting because we all use salt, but salt, sea salt is also from the sea, right? So it's like, okay, so you discern the salt, but not the, um, I mean, you discern the fish, but you don't discern the salt. Um, there, there's a lot of that. And I, I just think it's easier to sell, like eat a fat ribeye, but maybe not the fish, but I, we, in our practice, we highly recommend the fish. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. I mean, there's so much, uh, you know, value in that information. I think so many people could benefit. I mean, and you and I talked about this as far as, you know, being a hundred percent carnivore meat-based uh, including the seafood, the eggs. Uh, I just, I think that again, we're hunter gatherers. Uh, we hunt and we gather and there's some combination thereof. And we can, and that's what's great about what you guys are doing as far as individually tuning that into people. And obviously, you know, that's what we do in my company as well. Where, where does raw dairy fit into the, uh, or let's say dairy in general and uh, raw dairy, where does that fit into this whole thing? Yeah. So we're very, we do a lot of personalized medicine just because, I mean, when you're chronically ill, you cannot broad brush an answer. Um, raw milk, it depends on the person. So if you're insulin resistant, which actually a lot of our uh, clientele is, raw milk is probably not the best thing because it'll jump, it'll um, upshoot your blood sugar. And, but for my children, uh, because I, for my oldest child, for example, I put him on raw milk from the day he was, I think, age two, and he drank it for eight years straight in the morning. And so raw goat's milk was his go-to in the morning. And, and then my son, my second son, after he was like four, he started drinking a little bit too. But for them, because they're not insulin resistant, it's okay to have that raw goat's milk or raw dairy and be able to eat it. But for some people, uh, it really depends. So if they have an autoimmune, maybe dairy is inflammatory for them. Um, it really, and sometimes even the raw dairy, it might be that they might, they can try the cultured dairy, which removes some of the, um, the immune cells, but over more and more, it just really depends. And then if you are, you, if you have blood sugar dysregulation, or if you're type two diabetic, I see people that will drink half a gallon of raw dairy and or raw milk, and they will start like they will consistently still have blood sugar dysregulation. And so we will try to get them off, but it really depends. Yeah. I think one thing is you mentioned that about the kids and you mentioned it like the kids in the morning, I, I just find it, uh, it is like fairly easy, right? You know, that it's so nutrient dense right. and it takes no effort for us as adults to, you know, to get raw milk. We do have the goats, as I mentioned, you know, so we do get the goat's milk and we do also get raw cow's milk uh, and it does make life a little bit easier. We do some homemade uh, you know, chocolate milk and hot okay. chocolates, you know, with raw honey uh, and, uh, you know, the raw cacao and the raw milk. Uh, sometimes I'll throw in some raw organ powder in there. I'll try and sneak that in, cover that up with the raw honey. Our, our little girls don't, uh, don't mind it at all. My, our older boys, uh, sometimes they get a little suspicious when it has a liver taste and they're wondering where that came from. Um, oh, that's so smart. That's awesome stuff. So. And, uh, you know, again, like, you know, Carnivore Cure, fantastic book. You go through so much there, really walk people through. Uh, uh, you know, and I think so many people are getting benefit. Let's um, let's just circle back real quick, because you and I have talked a lot about, about mold and all these environmental toxins. You mentioned the concern about uh, toxins in the sea. I think these toxins, they're everywhere. They're all over planet Earth. It's not a matter of is the Earth, you know, getting warmer or cooler. It's just a matter of it's definitely polluted. We know that. We've tested our products, you know, like our wild salmon roe, and there's no microplastics uh, in there. Same thing with our product, which is encapsulated sardines. So we're not seeing it there. So okay. some of those concerns and claims, I think, are way overblown, and the benefits of seafood outweigh any risks. But Let's let, let's talk about environmental toxins and then maybe just jump into a conversation about mold as well. Yeah, let, let me touch on that. Um, I, I was talking to a doctor recently and he said to me, every decision we make has a risk and every decision has a reward. So it's 
I, I've heard all the comments about the fish and even that they're a higher poof account. And so therefore, if you have more polyunsaturated fatty acids, it can oxidize more, but in our clinical practice, and that's the beauty of having a practice is we see the benefits of inflammation reducing by eating more fish. And some people cannot tolerate fish because they have histamines. So when they eat the capsulated versions, we still see a reduction. And the biggest thing is that they see a reduction of pain, which I'm assuming is coming from the inflammation. So um, I do think that we have to always have concerted efforts in trying to do what's better in a net weight of what's more of a reward than a risk. And you're right, everything is polluted at this point, uh, whether it's organic plants, whether it's grass finished meats, there's always a chance you're getting some toxins that you aren't aware of, even if you're doing your best and trying to pay top dollar. So with all that said, I wrote carnivore cure when I thought meat fixed everything. Um, I, I fixed myself, so I thought, I know the answer. This is going to fix everyone until I had my clinical practice. Mike Tyson says, you have a plan until you get punched in the face. And that totally happened to me. So I started meeting people and they weren't being fixed by carnivore alone. Yes. Their gut health improved a little, their little improvements. Maybe they were at a F, level F or a grade F of health and they moved to a grade C, but they couldn't move beyond that. And that's when, um, there was one client many years ago that said, they're going to do a urinary mycotoxin test. So I said, okay, I'm all for it. And it was, everything was lit up. It was like a Christmas tree. And that's when I started looking into mold. And what I found over the years is as I work with people that are not fully getting better with the diet. So it's not like you said, it's not that you're leaving in a cucumber. It's not that there's seeds and sure. Some people will react to a cucumber. Um, there's actually a recall on cucumber right now because of salmonella, but I just thought that was so funny that came out right after our interview. Uh, but beyond that, it's, there's something else that's causing your body to be so inflamed that it's not just the diet. So if you've gone down to the strictest elimination diet and that's not moving the needle to full health, but there's something else that we need to search for with root cause. And what we found in our practice is that there's um, oftentimes it's the environment, you know, we, we, we know that we can catch viral infections with, uh, with the, just the air we breathe and in schools, that's why kids get so sick. But if our environment, if our homes, our buildings are the, the stuff we use to build our homes, and then if there's water damage, these things are really toxic. And what we have found is there is a big, big subset that if you are carnivore, you've tried the elimination diet and you're not moving the needle enough for health. Like you don't, you don't have the magical stories that everyone else has online. The magical story that I had, you might be suffering from something that's beyond the diet. It's not a, maybe I should remove coffee. Maybe I should remove cucumbers. At that point, it might be, maybe I'm suffering from something that my immune system cannot fight off. And we oftentimes find that it's mold. Sometimes it's Lyme. There's an act, um, maybe it's that COVID or mold um, act, reactivated Lyme or reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. But it's that usually oftentimes mold is a big deal. People think that a little bit of mold is not a big deal or that if a little bit of water damage, I see a little brown on my ceiling, not a big deal. Actually, it's a very big deal. And we've seen some people so, so sick. Uh, we had one client had MS or multiple sclerosis, uh, low hypothyroid Hashimoto's, went through carnivore, healed a lot, got stuck. And then um, she's li literally living in a tent right now because she was desperate to heal and she is healing and everything. No signs of um, no signs of um, MS symptoms or flares. Uh, her Hashimoto's it's being very well managed. She sleeps through the night. Her HRV is really good. Everything is healing because she did carnivore plus the um, living in a tent and doing a mold protocol, taking binders and um, and all of those other things. And the, the funny thing is as she's healing, she doesn't have to eat strict carnivore anymore. So now she could eat more keto or, you know, like more of an animal based diet where there's a lot of meat, but she could eat some plants that she wants to, because she enjoys it and she could, but she's healing. And so now she's building a tiny home and she'll be very mindful of the water damage that comes in. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the whole concept, right. About living in a tent and all these things. And I have those conversations with people you know, all the time. Uh, and uh, obviously it's drastic. All these different things are drastic and living in a tent certainly is. Uh, and it's, uh, but again, if you're, look, if you're looking to heal, these are the things that you have to do. Uh, I've often said this, you can't get healthy in the same environment where you got sick and you got to change up the environment, but that also includes changing up your nutrition, 
And I think carnivore is a great way to get people certainly on the road to recovery, but then as you look at all the other factors, uh, and maybe that's the you know the progression in a lot of cases like okay let's let's do a drastic change in your diet to get you feeling somewhat better uh while you can start working on these other factors right no you, you cannot heal some people can heal with diet alone but if you've had chronic illness and some of the clues are you you were always a sick kid uh you've always had something that you were um out of school for maybe it was an ear infection or maybe you always had stomach issues or pain or you had low energy compared to other kids i think when people uh, start really young and they were sick. Those are the people that may not heal with just diet alone. Um, other people we see in our practices, um, people that get injured by the shots we give, right? Maybe it's too much in too short of a time, or it's one that they shouldn't have got because their immune system can't handle it. And those are the ones that are immunocompromised. And then they, I've heard, we have so many people in our practice. It doesn't matter which shot it was, but it's ever since this, my health is bad. Or ever since I had a um, I, I got food poisoning in a different country. Now they have some viral infection or bacterial infection where they're not the same again. And so our goal is to reduce that inflammation and whether it's mold illness or a uh, food poisoning or what other, whatever other bacterial or viral infection or parasite, it's not the diet alone that will fix that. Uh, well, how would you describe your two books? Cause you have a new book that was released uh, in, in 2024, which is, uh, you know, the, the beginner's guide, you know, to carnivore, what, uh, uh, how would you describe the difference between the two books and kind of who, who are they geared towards? Yeah. So carnivore cure is very in-depth of the why. So it's the argument towards why a carnivore diet is so important. The elimination diet, um, some of the truths about our diet, our recommendations, uh, we talk about like the nuances about vitamin C. It talks about so much more. It's a lot more comprehensive. There is a part about uh, the lifestyle factors of sleep, fasting, and so on and so forth and hormones. And then the beginner's guide was a lot of people are like, just tell me the, how, like, how do, how do I do this diet? And it's just, that's too much information. I don't want it uh, for the chronically ill. I think that people gear more towards the carnivore cure book. Cause there's all these like little pro tips and little nuances for somebody that just wants to start this diet. Cause maybe they have weight to lose, or they're just not feeling their best or, and it's not a, uh, because I'm aging, but it's actually because something's imbalanced. Your body will always tell you something's wrong. The beginner's book still gives you a little bit of the argument and the case for carnivore. And then it tells you how to do the elimination diet. It gives you sort of the basics with, but giving you still a comprehensive understanding. And because I learned more about mold in that beginner's book, it does mention mold. So it will say, if you've given yourself an honest, earnest try about carnivore and you're not healing enough, you may want to look into environmental toxins. Yes. Yeah. And, you, and you know, you do uh, on your website, Nutrition with Judy, you got a wonderful post because that's in one question often comes up about people that are, you know, close to 100% on carnivore, where they get in their vitamin C from. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, as you point out in that blog post, that it really is, is that when, when you're eating the right way and living the right way, you don't really need as much vitamin C. Vitamin C is very important when you're unhealthy. Right. Uh, so that's all yeah. great information there. Yeah, vitamin C. Um, so one of the vitamin C receptors combats or competes with glucose receptors. Um, I, I think in the 40s, or maybe it was the 60s, the uh, dosage for vitamin C for men was 45, I think it's milligrams. And then, um, and then it doubled within 20 years, it became 90 milligrams. So the question is, what happened in just 20 years that the shift became 100% different? And so one factor that I'm assuming is that a glucose receptor and a vitamin C receptor compete with each other. And is it that we're eating too much sugar, which is blocking your vitamin C to get absorbed? So instead of saying, let's reduce the sugar, let's just increase the vitamin C. And that logic doesn't make sense. I know the concern is scurvy is a big deal, but that story of the sailors, all of them ate the same food, only half of them got scurvy. So what happened there? I think there's a lot more nuance, as you say, when we get sick, we'll take a little bit of vitamin C. I, I do not think it's a bad thing to supplement a little bit of vitamin C to support your immune system when you're unwell. But if you're not unwell, why do you need that vitamin C? I mean, there's enough data now on carnivores that aren't getting scurvy. And if people are getting scurvy, I wonder if there's a bigger root cause. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, great points. And we check people's intracellular levels of vitamin C okay. and we find when people are eating appropriately, their vitamin C levels, you know, look pretty good. And if their vitamin C levels are low, why is that being overly utilized as an antioxidant? It may not be a consumption deficiency yeah. per se. It's just all this oxidative stress 
that's being generated from all the environmental toxins. Totally agree. Exactly. Um, and we, we do cellular tests too. Um, another argument that they always bring up to us is fiber. And we've seen on the map with our with stool tests, it's all over the map, the um, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Whether you're a carnivore or not, it's some people have it high, some people have it low, some people have it within range. I think the data is too new, but I'm a fan of probiotics. So I think of herbs, as, so plants, um, as medicine. So there are certain things that we can pull from the root or the stem. I mean, when you have Lyme disease, a lot of times you're using herbals and tinctures to support that, um, to, to help support your immune system, basically to get rid of these toxins in you. So I just think that it's not that all plants are bad. Um, I think that like, I'm not dogmatic that way. I know that herbals, we've used it forever to get better. And there are certain medicinal factors and it's just figuring out what ones work for you. And when you're eating a mostly plant-based diet or a heavy plant-based diet, uh, we may just have to change things up for a bit to see what will bring further healing. Excellent. Well, this has been great information. Nutrition with Judy. Uh, Judy Cho is our guest. And again, this has uh, been wonderful. Uh, great. Uh, you know, again, insight into you personally. I appreciate you sharing all those stories. And nutritionwithjudy.com is your best website. How else can people keep in touch with you? Uh, we're on all the social media platforms. I have my own podcast is nutrition with Judy. And yes, it's very meat based focus, but we talk about all things. So uh, lately we've been on a kick about mold. We've been on a kick about Lyme, um, MCAS, mind body work. We just opened a mind body program because another factor we see is when you're chronically ill, your mindset of the world becomes super negative. And so when you focus on the negative in the world, you're going to wake up with this cortisol response, which is already causing your body to be in a destructive state. And our goal is to get you uh, more in a calm state so you can reduce your, um, your inflammation and you can be in a rest and digest that. So our practice is always focused on root cause healing. And so Nutrition with Judy, uh, the podcast and all social media platforms. That is absolutely fantastic. So Judy Cho, thank you so much. I'm Dr. Jack Wolfson, cardiologist. And this was a phenomenal episode of the Healthy Heart Show. We will see you next time. Thank you so much for having me.